Welcome everyone. We want to thank all the attendees and panelists for joining our session today. My name is Iman Bakioko, and I'm joined by my team members, Ethan Beecher, Chloe Gavigan, Julia Hook, Talia Sharp, and Isabel Wolf. We are the members of the American University PR Portfolio class, and we have organized a panel discussion about a very important topic, food waste. Tonight, we'll discuss food waste, how it affects our climate, and what we as individuals can do to fight food waste in our communities. We want this panel to be an open discussion about food waste. We'll start with a 30 minute discussion followed by 30 minutes of Q&A. Please write your questions or comments for the panelists in the chat. Thank you for joining us. Now my colleague Julia will introduce our panelists. Hello everyone. My name is Julia Hook and tonight I will be moderating the discussion with my colleague Ethan. It is our pleasure to introduce the panelists for this evening. Our first panelist is Professor Garrett Grady Lovelace. Professor Grady researches and teaches global environmental and agricultural policy in agrarian politics. She draws upon political ecology and decolonial studies to research agricultural biodiversity conservation, land use decisions, and domestic and global impacts of US farm policies. She is senior personnel for AU's $15 million National Science Foundation Recipes Grant on food waste. She is a faculty affiliate for AU's Anti-Racist Research and Policy Center and associate director for the new Center for Environment, Community, and Equity. Thank you for joining us today, Professor Grady Lovelace. Next, we'd like to introduce Ali Sale. Ali is an American University School of Communication alum and spokesperson for Too Good To Go the number one app fighting food waste. The Too Good To Go app connects users with local businesses that have surplus food so that this food can be enjoyed instead of wasted. Users get delicious meals at a great price, local businesses reach new customers, and the planet has less wasted food to deal with. Too Good To Go has saved over a million meals in the US since September 2020. That's the CO2 equivalent of 492 flights around the world. Thank you for joining us tonight, Allie. Lastly, we're thrilled to welcome Jesse Cross. Jesse is an American University graduate student studying environmental science and leadership and ethical development. He is also the American University Zero Waste Manager. Jesse is the alumnus of the Student Conservation Association, executive board member of the Student Zero Waste Club, a founding member of AU's Food Recovery Network chapter and a member of the College of Arts and Sciences Leadership and Ethical Development Program. In the summer of 2019, Jesse served on an AmeriCorps Student Conservation Association trip in Alaska for 15 weeks, where he worked for the Department of Interior on various trail management projects. Thank you for joining us tonight, Jesse. Before we hear from our panelists, we would like to show a video brought to you by Too Good To Go that briefly explains the impact food waste has on the environment. Foundation. Global food production constitutes the single largest driver of environmental degradation and transgression of planetary boundaries. Our food system accounts for up to 30% of all greenhouse gas emissions and is by far the biggest user of freshwater resources. We continue to clear forests for agriculture, driving biodiversity loss, and use pesticides that make their way into our oceans. The good news is it's not too late to reverse this damage. Our food system needs transformation now. And most importantly, we need to stop wasting the food we do produce. Reducing food waste is the most impactful, immediate, and simple action we can take. It is time to fight food waste together. Just as a reminder, we'll start with a discussion followed by a Q&A. Please write your questions or comments for the panelists in the chat. Thank you. All all again for joining us. Now let's get started. Our first question for the panel is, what is food waste and why should we care about it? Ali, would you like to start us off? 
Sure. Um, so food waste is really anything that we're growing or producing that's not consumed. Um, for a consumer, it could be anything from like your leftover apple cores or potato peels to um, pieces of pizza that get stuck in the back of your fridge that you end up throwing out. Um, and then why should we care about it is really when we're wasting food, we're wasting all of the energy and water um, it's taking to grow the food, harvest the food, transport the food and package it. And then when this food does go into um, a landfill, it rots. And the problem with it rotting is it creates a huge amount of methane gas, which is one of like the most potent greenhouse gases that we're facing. Um, and food waste actually is contributing to 10% of global greenhouse gases, which is why it's one of the most important things that we can do, you know, as a civilization to cut back and help fight climate change. Um, there's a ton more stats that I'm sure we'll get into throughout this conversation, but uh, those are the ones that I would start with. It's crazy, honestly, how much food waste impacts our environment. Um, Professor Grady Lovelace, is, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Um, Ali summarized it well. Um, and by the way, Ali, your work is so important. Um, so Jesse and Ali, it's such an honor to be on the panel with you all and the work that you all are doing in this. I feel like much of the work that I do is chronicling how bad things are. So it's really inspiring to be with people who are actually mitigating and doing the work of um, transforming the systems that we're in, which are so destructive. Um, I think an interesting thing that has come about with this big grant, which is by the way, dozens of institutions. AU happens to be the primary insti principal instigator, uh, principal investigator, but also like instigating the change um, with my colleague and friend, Saule um, Siddiqui, who's the um, lead on it. But there's actually so many other um, institutions and NGOs and um, universities and disciplines involved. And we've decided to use the word wasted food rather than food waste, which seems tiny. But actually, it gets to the heart of so much of what we think of as waste is actually still edible or could be used. It's either food for the soil or it, you know, there's biodigesters, there's all kinds of engineering, wherein the kind of energy and the caloric properties of the food, um, once they start rotting, actually produce energy and are constructive and productive rather than just emitting methane in its current formation in the landfill. So we're kind of shifting away from thinking about waste as the central piece of what we're doing to think about food um, ecologically and human nourishment as the central piece of what we're doing and the tragedy of wasting that food. Um, and also just what is waste? I think we in kind of a kind of advanced corporate capitalist system, you use something once and then you throw it away. Well, the away is an illusion. It never goes away. <laughs> you know, it might kind of rot into the system at its best, um, but particularly single use plastic. So even just the, the mentality that waste, what is waste? And I think the next generation is going to have to radically re-engineer and rethink and redesign our system of food and also just, you know, what, everything we're using away from thinking about single use waste to thinking about what are the different lives and iterations of what we use and what we consume. So um, we, we, we're, we're, our grant is about wasted um, food, is about wasted food um, rather than food waste is how we're thinking of it. I think you explained that perfectly. And that is such an interesting way how you changed and put um, wasted food. Um, so you kind of touched upon this, how the next generation is gonna have to radically um, change the food system. You know, How can we change our food system? And what are some policies the US government can pass to help end food waste? Um, such a great question. Um, even just asking the question is huge. I went to school in the 90s, went to college in the 90s and got various degrees and various PhDs and various things. And food was not a topic that was in the curriculum. Even at land grant universities, you might study agricultural economics, but the kind of food system as a subject matter was not part of what it meant to be educated. It was so off the radar in terms of like curriculum um, and, and even like research topics. Now it's booming. Now at this point, you've got everything from massive land grants to liberal arts, to private community college, like the whole spectrum of, um, of education recognizes that food systems is of primary importance, that people understand how they work, the environmental impacts, the labor 
the tragedy of the labor exploitation of our food systems from restaurant workers on through food deliverers on through all the people toiling in the fields, you know, undocumented and exploited. So the broader food system, um, food systems as a push factor of migration, as a pull factor of migration, um, food insecurity is what drives, you know, various conflicts. Um, so the climate impacts, the environmental impacts, the cultural impacts. So at this point, just even having your generation recognize the importance of a food system analysis and asking the questions about policy interventions is already so heartening. Um, the reality of the food system and its impacts is disheartening. So I feel like the more you research it and realize how dire the economic situation is with regard to disparity and hunger right now, famine, outright famine is happening. Overall food insecurity rates have doubled after COVID domestically and internationally, malnourishment. Um, so there's all kinds of really frightening aspects to the political economy and the ecology of food. But I say what, what's so um, um, exciting is that you've got all of these smart minds thinking about engineering interventions or you know food justice. I've seen Eileen is in the audience, all these kind of smart minds thinking about um, food system interventions and food justice and food sovereignty. So, um, yeah, asking the question is the first step. Yeah, I would just like to piggyback off of that and say, you know, awareness is a huge one. I, I am always so impressed. We get reached out to at Too Good To Go by tons of college students from universities across the country um, who are super interested in the work we're doing and like, how can we bring it to, you know, Colorado? How can we bring it to Vermont? Everyone, everyone really wants to help solve the food waste issue. Um, but when we look at it on a larger scale, you know, we just had COP26 in Glasgow and food waste, you know, really wasn't a talking point that was on the table. So I think awareness for us is like the biggest thing we're pushing. Um, we were uh, started in Europe, so we're working way more in policy in Europe right now. We just launched in, in the U.S. last year, um, and hopefully once we've done our expansion, um, we'll be ready to work uh, hand in hand with policymakers over here too. But I think just getting it from like grassroots level of people who know about food waste to like actually, you know, contacting your representatives, getting them to put that on um, to what like the government is talking about, what COP26 is talking about, what our global leaders are talking about. I think that is what is really going to move the needle for us. Yeah, to add on a bit to that as well, um, it's also really important to have the necessary infrastructure and collection systems for all that food waste. Um, so much of food waste goes to landfill, especially from single family homes and commercial residences, that it's really important to just have systems that can efficiently collect that in a timely manner. If you leave food waste to sit for too long, it will go bad and people will notice. And then similarly, when you bring it to facilities, facilities need to properly manage that food waste or once again, you'll have those odor and pest issues that make food waste, you know, that could cause people to be resistant to composting their food waste. So they think that, oh, it's just gonna add to these bad smells and these rats running around everywhere. So really having collection systems that run efficiently and don't cause those horrible odors and pests is really important. You know, Allie mentioned how college students are starting to reach out and learn more about food waste or wasted food. Um, and Jesse, you are a graduate student. How did you get into the field of sustainability? How did you become the zero waste manager? Could you talk more about that? Yeah, sure. I uh, started at AU in a fall 2018 and I went to an intro meeting for the Student Zero Waste Club and uh, my old boss, Tyler Orden, he was there and he was like, oh, hey, who wants to collect food waste for this new student run compost collection program we're doing? And well, it was DC minimum wage and I didn't mind collecting trash. so. I said, sure. And so I've just stuck around the office ever since. And um, my boss recently left to go work at another great job, I believe at FEMA. And they offered me the position when I graduated over in the spring. So I became the zero waste manager in September and I really had a fun time with it. We've continued really building off the things he started. He worked a lot with creating a uh, independent waste hauler system at AU. So that means that we have a lot of control over, we have complete control actually, over where we send our waste. And then that student run program, we have also really built up a lot since the semester has started. I believe we've collected around, I wanna say about 12 or 13 tons of food waste. Uh, yes, sorry, not 12 or 13 tons, 12,000 or 3,000 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> Got that stuck in my head for a second. Wow, that's incredible. Um, so, you know, for Jesse and Professor Garrett Grady-Lee um, Lovelace, um, 
you know, what has American University been doing with food waste and sustainability? Like, could you go more into depth about the zero waste um, club, Jesse? Sure. So the um, Zero Waste Club doesn't work too much with food waste. There is an offshoot of them called the Food Recovery Network. They've been the ones who've been working a lot with dieting to start collecting um, edible food from campus, you know, instead of sending it to, uh, you know, I guess us in the compost or to landfill. Um, they're starting up. I think their goal is to start doing collections in uh, spring 2021. They've already, um, they work a lot with Chartwells on that. Chartwells has been an incredible partner for that. Um, and within the Zero Waste Office, that's really where a lot of our organics collections happens. So our entire um, organics collection system is run by, I wanna say about 13 interns who visit all the dining locations on main campus and collect food waste from them. So that's locations such as TDR, to the Kerwin Cafe, to even that little library, um, sorry, to the little cafe down the library. Um, every location on main campus that produces some form of food waste, be it coffee grounds or you know food that students don't eat, we try and collect that as much as we can. And that's you know where we kind of get that, you know, around six or seven tons of food waste. Um, and those students do an excellent job of managing that. Those students are also part of um, checking all the um, orange bins on campus. We have a system that we partnered with housekeeping to correct, um, create where we um, have to check each of those bags um, for contaminants because our partner facility in Prince George's County has a very strict contamination limit because if you have any contaminants in compost, you can see it you know, once it's done through that, um, that process. So we have to be incredibly careful with how that system runs. And so we're very grateful to our team of interns who both collect that food waste, track how much of it we are collecting, and also ensure that everything that enters our organic compactor is clean and suitable for um, composting. That's so impressive, um, Jesse. I'll say one of the things about AU students is that there's, there's so many smart people working on this over the past, I've been at AU now for a decade, um, but they graduate. And so there's always the risk that the institutional memory will be lost and that there'll be great um, you know, strides in the AU community garden um, and even the composting facility there. And then the leaders of that will graduate and there'll be a lull before it picks up again. Um, and also through COVID, you know, there was a, a, a fear that some of the momentum around this would, would wane. But in fact, there's just this growing interest um, and such multifaceted interventions here. So I'm so impressed with the work that you all are doing, Jesse. And yeah, a quick shout out just to the AU Community Garden as well. The Community Garden is really great. There's a great team working on that. Um, but with our compost, you know, we were very concerned that we were going to lose that momentum as we went, you know, because we had a very experienced team of interns running this program before yeah. COVID. And then we started, you know, with really not many. And the students have really stepped up to the plate and made this collection system work so much more successfully than I could have imagined for a group of students who really hadn't had any experience before this um, semester. And we're looking to grow. We still have to um, hit some offsites. So um, Spring Valley and Washington College of Law are locations that are on target for the uh, spring. So going back to Allie, you mentioned how Too Good To Go has been working in Europe, um, working on policies. Um, could you talk more, what kind of change has Too Good To Go been able to implement in Europe? Yeah, I think um, the biggest thing that we are working on right now is our date labeling campaign, um, which we've done in France um, and also the UK. Um, we just launched our date labeling campaign in Spain. And basically what that is, is we're really trying to um, educate people on the difference between a use by date and a best by date. Um, so if you think of a use by date, that's like, um, you know, this milk has to be used by this date or else it's spoiled, it's bad, don't drink it. Um, but when you think about a best by date, it's like, um, if I have a bag of Cheetos, right, and it's best by today, that means that today, the Cheeto company will guarantee that when I open the Cheetos and take that Cheeto out, it will taste 100% like a Cheeto. That's not saying that like five days later, five weeks later, five months later, you might have, you know, 99% of a Cheeto or 98% of a Cheeto, but it's still going to be edible. It's still going to be like good to consume. So our, um, the thing we're doing right now in Europe, it's called look, smell, taste, don't waste. And we've partnered with a ton of really big and small food brands across Europe to put um, date labels on their packaging that say, you know, this is a best buy date, Make sure you're using your senses, make sure you're looking, you're smelling and you're tasting before you throw this out. 
Um, I know a lot of the people who I work with were super big into food waste and how you can, you know, repurpose, remix things um, and take things that are, you know, best buy, have passed their best buy date and really like um, test them to make sure they're still good. I know people who, you know, have eaten yogurts that are like nine months past their expiration date because they used all their senses and decided it was okay, okay to eat. So what we're really pushing for in Europe is on the consumer level, if you're going to purchase the food, then that is your um, kind of responsibility to really make sure before you take that food that you, you know, spent all your money on and throw it in the trash, you're really using your senses to decide for yourself, is this safe to eat, is it not? And if it's a best by date, we really want people to take that into consideration and you know, eat the Cheeto that's five days past its best by date, it's not gonna kill you. Thank you for sharing. I know I always struggle with those dates. They always confuse me. Um, but I see that Professor Grady Lovelace, you just posted a link in the chat about the food waste reduction um, in the farm bill. Would you like to talk more about that? Yeah, a little wins. Um, I feel like the EU is a little bit ahead of the US on this front um, for a variety of interesting reasons. But um, the 2018 Farm Bill, the Farm Bill is the major piece of agricultural policy legislation. It's an omnibus, meaning it's a lot of things. Um, and it comes up about every five years or so. And so the 2018 one did have some small um, interventions around food waste because of the momentum and the activism that had been growing um, around the country, largely youth led, frankly, and student led. Um, and so some of this had to do parallel with the EU in terms of labeling, which is not actually based in um, science or even law a lot of the times. It's really just like the companies will put a random label on and frankly, it incent it's incentivized to them to have a a short um, you know, window of time of best, best buy so that there's a more, more consumption and purchasing happening. So um, kind of built in incentives to have people throw out that milk after a few days or throw out that cheese, um, particularly cheese, which obviously could go longer as cheese is aged. Um, and so the labeling issue and also the liability, a lot of times a big institution has food that has not even been served yet, be it a cafeteria. So it could definitely be repurposed if it didn't get served. Um, it's still in kind of its serving trays, but they aren't allowed to even give it to a homeless shelter, um, much less other institutions because of liability laws that are overly strict. And so kind of changing some of that so there's more of a re food recovery um, flow and, and people can really be thinking about how to move food when it's still good and hot even um, and prepared. So those are small interventions. There needs to be much more, but do check out. And then there's also Chelly Pingree, um, a House representative from Maine also has some good work on food waste caucus, bipartisan effort. Um, but again, I feel like there's a broader structural problem of overproduction of commodity crops and even people's relationships with food, kind of recovering a close relationship. Even Ali, what you're saying about smell, taste, touch, just even learning about food and how some things is actually dangerous if it is, is you know, held too long, like certain meats, but other things, it's not dangerous. If cheese has a little mold on it, you cut that mold off and eat the rest of the cheese. So even just that kind of cultural knowledge, which I think used to be much more widespread, but we've been very removed from our food and the broader kind of life of plants to know what is dangerously old and what's not dangerously old at all. That was very well said. Um, so, you know, I bet our audience is wondering, you know, what are some everyday activities that students and those listening um, can take to be more sustainable? Um, Jesse, would you like to start us off? Yeah, sure. Um, I guess for something that's more general, um, meal planning I found is super helpful. Um, I know this probably isn't the most useful for students who may live on campus, don't have that storage for meals like that, but for people living off campus, um, just planning your meals and your grocery lists to make sure you buy what you need and you know you don't accidentally throw anything out is really important for students living on campus you know with tdr i know when i was a student um tdr would sometimes give me huge portions you know sometimes asking the staff you know hey you know not as much as you usually do is something i've had to do especially with breakfast when they would give me so many eggs it's like i can't eat all that eggs in the morning um so that's really helpful with um you know asking staff and maybe just taste testing something first before getting it in case maybe you don't like it and then um, also another fun campus thing with that Food Recovery Network, we are looking for volunteers to help us recover from campus as Food Recovery Network um, is a, a national organization where you have a university chapter that's comprised of volunteers who work with dining to collect um, that edible food. So I'll be put, putting the link to that in that chat, but that's another really great way to get involved on campus without fighting food waste. 
And also the most important thing with Canvas as well, I nearly forgot this, is sorting your waste with those uh, compost bins. So really making sure that you sort your waste and you know putting only food waste and compostable waste into those orange bins is super important because if my interns or housekeeping find contaminants in there, we unfortunately have to throw that bag out because once again, our partner facility in Prince George's County cannot accept contaminants. So really doing your best to sort waste is super helpful for us. I think uh, my biggest tips would just be to uh, like Jesse said, really plan out your meals. So when you're going to go to the grocery store, make sure you know what you're shopping for, what you're planning on making, how many servings you want to have for that week. Um, I'm sorry if you can hear a siren. I'm in my New York City apartment. Um, but yeah, just really make sure you're planning for what you are going to consume. And then the freezer is always a great, you know, um, plan B. So I know like personally, like um, I have a ton of like fresh produce in my freezer from the summer because um, in the winter, it's really hard to get, you know, good fruits and vegetables. But anytime, you know, you have a little bit of spinach left over and you think uh, it's the weekend, I don't really feel like cooking and I want to go to a restaurant for a meal, just bag it up, put it in the freezer. And then the next time you need like greens for a smoothie or, you know, it's in the winter and you can't find fresh spinach, you have it ready to go. So I think really number one, you should be planning your meals out. But number two, if it's still good and edible, just throw it in the freezer and it will stay good for, you know, nine, 10 months, even more. That's a great tip. I have never thought of that surprisingly. I've, you know, I've frozen some bananas for smoothies and stuff, but spinach, that is such a great idea. Professor Grady Lovelace, is there anything you'd like to add? Any other everyday activities people can do? Um, I mean, soup stocks are an ancient way of taking parts of the vegetables, like, um, you know, even just like the end of a carrot, you know, that isn't pretty enough to eat in a salad, um, but it's still good. So um, there are, you know, certain stews and certain soup stocks that are essentially like the the stalk of the broccoli, you know, or various things that might get that composted um, or even thrown away it could be repurposed and then sauteed um, into a soup stock. And I think this gets to a, also a deeper question. One of the questions I think by Claire was about social justice. Um, and the first wave of interest about food waste that happened about a decade ago, the numbers started coming out, the data started coming out, and the data was really shocking to people. People intuited that there was a lot of food waste, but there really wasn't like methodology or really data synthesis. And then the data started getting aggregated. And I think it blew everyone's mind that there's 40% of the food that we eat is wasted. And so the initial response was kind of blaming people and blaming consumers or individual people, you know, um, and it's individual people's fault that they are wasting food or can't really, you know, handle, you know, the stuff that they get from the grocery store before it goes bad. But I would, I, I think there's a whole move to push back against that and say, um, there's a whole set of skills to cooking from scratch, ancient skills, using the whole part of the animal, using whole part of the plant. And those skills oftentimes um, have been pretty systematically devalued by education systems as being kind of, you know, peasant or underdeveloped or, you know, um, not educated, not intellectual. Oftentimes they've been gendered in their devaluation or racialized or classed internationally, kind of like the skill sets of how to grow food, the skill sets of how to save from scratch, of how to you know, harvest or butcher all of the animal or you know, save seeds. And so I feel like there's a, an important part of this of re-honoring the skills of cooking from scratch and using all parts of the animal, all parts of the food as intellectual and powerful and political skills. And so there's a whole feminism to that and a whole anti-racism to re-honoring re, re um, those, those kitchen skills. Beautifully said. Um, so before we answer more questions from the audience, um, I have one last question for you all. Um, if those listening were to only remember one thing from tonight, what would you hope it is? Um, Allie, would you like to start us off? Yeah, I think the biggest thing for me is that reducing food waste is the most impactful action that we can take individually and as a society to fight climate change. So if you're going to make one change in your day-to-day -day lifestyle, um, it should be to think about how you, you know, consume, buy, use your food, and really make the most of it.
Jesse, would you like to add to that? Sure. Um, I think something I'd add, you know, is that um, even though food waste seems like an incredibly huge issue, especially since you have like stats and figures that say, you know, like 33% of all food produced is wasted, you know, we are working on it. We are making an impact on this and that, you know, the future is looking very hopeful, you know, with how we're going to be handling food waste in the future. And it's not just all lost or something. <laughs> Um, these are such good points. I would say, um, building off of both of what Ali and Jesse had said, um, food waste is a result of devaluing food and devaluing the labor of growing food and devaluing the skill sets of cooking it. Um, so it is the logical result of a systemic devaluation and alienation from food. So I feel like finally, as people are in the, you know, young people are really thinking about how to intervene and prevent and recover food. It's a window into reconnecting people to the entire food system and food chain and revaluing all of the labor and the work of of growing food and cooking food. So I think it's actually a beautiful opportunity to um, reconnect with, with food and land um, as such. Thank you all for sharing. Um, now I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, Ethan, who will moderate um, the Q&A portion of the evening. Everybody, please remember to submit your questions or comments for the panelists below. Thank you. All right, hi everyone. Um, <clears throat> So um, thank you, Julia. Um, now let's go to the Q&A portion. Please remember to enter any questions you have into the chat below. Um, and our first question is, as college students, should our goal, what should our goals and targets be in terms of sustainability? Um, so I guess, yeah, what would be like, we've already touched on some things we could do. I, I guess like what would be like a exact, or like a nice goal to have as like an individual um, for maybe like how, um, how many, I don't know exactly, maybe like a weekly goal we could have for uh, the amount of food that we, you know, use or like maybe like how much, what percentage of our food should we be using? Obviously a hundred percent, but um, as individuals, what would maybe be like a nice goal for a college student to be able to like reach for? Um, yeah. I can start. Um, for AU, at least, I think a really nice goal for a college student to have is to really understand our three main um, waste streams on campus, trash, recycling, and compost, and to really make a good job that you really understand what goes into each of those bins. Because, you know, as I mentioned earlier, contamination is um, an issue for us, and we really try to handle as much contamination as we can, but really our most, you know, effective interventions as of right now are really after students throw items into the bin. So really making sure that you place the right items into those bins is really important. Um, I think that's a really fun thing with food waste that there is a lot of individual action you can do. Um, one thing I like to tell people is that, you know, AU, we can do a lot to, you know, make items more compostable on campus, to make things easier to read, to, um, you know, reduce the number of different like package items there are on campus. But if a student throws a Barilla spaghetti box into the compost bin, we can't do anything about that. So really helping to make sure that those waste streams are really staying nice and clean is super important for us. And if you have a question, always reach out to either um, our email, zerowaste.american.edu or into the Instagram. You know, there are interns and myself, we're always happy to answer questions if students have, you know, questions about how do I sort an item or I've seen this before, I don't understand like what the plastic type number is at the bottom. So we're always, you know, willing to help students and ask. And also, you know, the Office of Sustainability is willing to do the exact same thing as well. So really always just keeping an understanding of what our waste streams are on campus and really not hesitating to ask questions if you are confused about something. Great, thank you. Um, our next question is, um, and this will be directed at Ali, how does Too Good To Go help the local community in the cities that it is in? Yeah, so um, we have launched in 14 cities across the US in the last year, including DC, which we launched in March. Um, and I was super excited to launch in DC because you know I'm an American alum. Um, but basically what we do is when we are going to launch a city, we have people on the ground who go and reach out to all of the restaurants, bakeries, grocery stores, any, any food business in the area to say, um, just start a conversation and say, hey, do you have food waste? Um, and a lot of times, even if they come back and say, you know, we don't have any food waste, we further that conversation with them and find out, you know, a dozen bagels go to waste at the end of the day, or they're throwing out five pizzas. 
Um, and the way we help the community is we are a marketplace that connects consumers and food businesses together so that the end of the day surplus doesn't get thrown in the bin. Um, so let's say there's a pizza shop that you know, they make 50 pies a day because they don't know how many people are going to come in. Some days they sell 47, some days they sell 48. At the end of the day, um, as a consumer, you still expect to walk into that pizza shop and get the same service that, you know, you would have gotten when you went in for lunch. Um, so they're always going to have that little bit of surplus. And what we do is we help connect consumers directly to that surplus for a third of the price. Um, and our th whole thing is we want to make it number one, easy for businesses to, instead of throwing that food away, just, you know, put it aside for someone to come to pick up and for consumers, you know, um, we're not the easiest app choice. You know, we're not a DoorDash, we're not an Uber Eats. You can't, um, go on to our app and get something delivered. We really want you to go to the store, to make that human connection, um, to go in and support a local business, to talk about fighting food waste and really bond, you know, with that restaurant or bakery on that topic. Um, and then walk away with some great food. You know, it's going back to that pizza, pizza shop example, um, it's pizza that would have sold for full price 15 minutes before they close, but now they're closing and there's nothing that they can do with it. Um, so instead of them throwing that wonderful food away, now you get to go home with it for a third of the price. Um, and we think, you know, not only are you supporting local business, but it helps people who are food insecure too, to gain access to food. Um, you know, you spend like four to $6 on a bag and you get, you know, 12 to $20 worth of food. Um, that you get to walk away with. So we're really all about, you know, building that community with the partners we have and also the app users who um, come along the ride with us. Nice. And I think that's great because not only does it uh, mitigate food waste, but it also, like you said, helps those who, um, or it gives more accessibility to food, those to to those who are uh, food insecure. And it also starts that conversation with uh, consumers and business partners, which I think is really important. Honestly, I didn't even think of but I think that's a great way to get the conversation around uh, food waste too. Um, so our next question is from Natasha and she asks, are there efforts to address food waste along the supply chain before it gets used? I'm thinking of ugly food that gets discarded before it even gets used. I can just say a little bit on this, such a good question. Um, there is, this is one of those examples of how wasted food is kind of um, opening doors of broader systemic change in the food system. So um, the dominant food system is all about homogeneity. And so the industrial model is that you have all of the apples that need to go into Whole Foods or you know, um, um, Safeway have to look a certain way and have to be perfect, blemish-free, highly waxed. You know, there's all kinds of like chemical compounds to make sure that there's an industrial and very homogenous, very monocropped production system. And then the process of shipping them and the process of them, the display. Um, and so anything that's outside of that kind of ideal model um, gets tossed. And so um, this expectation on the consumer end makes its way back into the production distribution system. And it creates kind of a hegemony that we've been in for a while. And so finally, this interest in ugly food and understanding the impact of wasted food ecologically and economically and the injustice of it um, is changing consumer expectations, which is changing broader corporate models, which is changing the broader distribution systems. And then now are these other, um, not just flows of food that, you know, wonky food or ugly food or misfit food, um, but even consumers who want that, to want to be part of this movement. Um, and so it's really radically opening up space in the whole supply chain, which I think is so exciting. It's not big enough. I think there needs to be more, but it's happening. So thank you, Natasha, for that question. Nice. And thank you, Dr. Grady Lovelace, for that uh, response. That was very well said and great explanation. Um, and uh, Dr. Grady Lovelace, you already kind of mentioned this uh, before, but um, Claire had a question about how can we tie this issue, uh, the issue of food waste, into other social justice issues in the U.S. and abroad? Can you speak on the possible intersection between wasted food and increased homelessness? 
Yeah, it's such a good question. And actually, it sounds like Ali might also be able to kind of think through how um, on a micro level or a municipal level, these apps or these food recovery networks are literally moving food in real time to need either homeless shelters, obviously DC Central Kitchen, which is a model that's based in DC. And then they've now LA Central Kitchen and it's being moved around. That's thinking through food recovery from the standpoint of serving communities in need, unhoused communities, and even employing people who are you know returning citizens who've escaped the criminal justice system and its injustices and weaving that movement into the food um, food recovery movement. So there's a lot of, of, of the, the acuteness and the acute you know, contradictions and hypocrisies of having overconsumption of food and all of this food waste with people who cannot afford fresh vegetables for their children in a rich city, in a rich country is um, catalyzing these connections and these powerful interventions. Yeah, I think um, something to really think about is, uh, as we've covered before, 40% of food in the U.S. gets wasted, um, and almost, you know, over a third of it, of food gets wasted globally, but only 3% of the food waste or surplus food is getting donated to, um, you know, feed people who are food insecure. And I we've talked about this earlier, but a lot of that comes down to liability and um, can a restaurant give someone food at the end of the day for free? Who has the liability? Um, like if that food were to make someone sick. So where we step in is um, we kind of have, because you are using a marketplace, that liability is a continuous stream. So there's no question mark there around the legality of selling surplus food at the end of the day. Um, and we also work to partner with um, food insecurity organizations and all of the markets we're in. We're still nailing down um, what our partner in DC is going to be, but it sounds like Professor Grady Lovelace might be able to connect us to someone. Um, and we really believe that like everyone has a part to play in the food rescue ecosystem. Um, and so it's super important that we're working hand in hand with these organizations, not only to give people options to buy great food, food at a reduced price, but to give back to communities um, by donating, you know, a, a specific percentage of um, our profits directly to these organizations. And we also make sure that in our app, there are fundraising um, capabilities so that people who are using us can support those local charities as well. Great. Um, so one of our next questions is uh, do, 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 from uh, Claire, and she asks, what are some of the latest innovations in technology and, sci and science to help combat wasted food or transform or transform the life cycle of food? Allie probably knows this too, but the apps, I mean, just the, the, the real time everyone's got on their phone, frankly, we're all being tracked on our phone. We might as well use that surveillance, you know, technology to figure out, well, where's the food? How can we get it? Someone needs a pizza. Someone has an extra pizza. So I feel like it's reclaiming the hyper surveillance life that we're living um, in an interesting way. Um, for kind of self-knowledge of where our system is and where, where the food is flowing. But there's also really interesting engineering around biodigesters and actually moving food once it gets composted into energy production. So Saule and the broader NSF grant is working with engineers um, and even urban planners. This gets into some of Jesse's work too, um, about like our waste streams are really counterproductive, you know, our current weight understanding of waste. And so just like radically rethinking it from an engineering and an urban planning perspective, as well as from an app and a technology perspective. Yeah, we have a lot of friends in the food waste space. Um, Misfit Market, Imperfect Food, they're working, you know, to save that imperfect produce um, or products from going into the waste stream. Um, also, Appeal is a really cool company. Um, and they work to kind of like, there's this edible coating that they have developed that um, allows produce to last like two weeks longer. I know that they've been like piloting it. They started with avocados because we all know how finicky an avocado can be. Um, so that when the avocados get to, you know, the grocery store, you know, you have about, you know, two weeks to consume that avocado before it goes bad instead of going home with your avocados and having them all spoil by the next day. Um, so I think there's a lot of innovations. And I think the cool thing is we are like a community of 
like food waste companies, um, there's not a lot of competition. I know a question we get asked a lot is like, who is your biggest competitor? And our answer is always like, we don't have a competitor, um, but we would we would welcome one because you know food waste is such a huge issue. Right now, we're only in 14 U.S. cities. If there was someone who would come in and you know swallow up the West Coast or come in and you know get the East Coast on board, we would welcome that because it's an issue that needs to be fixed now, not later. And so while we are trying to expand as quickly as possible to get our solution everywhere, um, when we do see smaller you know, startups or other companies kind of join us in this fight, we are always like very excited, very welcoming. Yeah, I think some other interesting things, um, a little bit similar to what uh, Professor Grady Lovelace was talking about was um, we're also seeing smaller composting systems so Prince George's County is a gigantic, you know, windrow composting facility where you have large piles of like, you know, compostable waste and you flip it over with tarps. And now you're seeing smaller things, some that could hypothetically even fit on AU's campus. So that's really cool to see this technology sort of condense, which is really awesome. And um, similar to that, you also see changes sort of like in the transportation system. So new sensors and modules that can really track how food is doing so that to make sure that food really does arrive to a store, you know, that's not spoiled or anything, or, you know, even can even sort of like give an alert that it needs to be routed somewhere closer if it will spoil by the time it arrives at a market. Great. Thank you for all those answers. And Ali, it was, uh, that's like just such, I mean, I know personally, that's like such a great thing to hear that like a company is so willing to have a competitor and willing to even like you know, lose some money if it means like making this vision and making this idea, um, you know, come to fruition. And that's really exciting. And uh, that fills me with a lot of optimism, honestly. Um, one of the next questions is, what about the impact of food packaging? It seems to be a large waste and impact on the environment. Um, so I guess, uh, what what are the, some of the effects of food packaging? And um, yeah, what are the, what's the impact of it on the environment? And maybe even are there, you know, going back to the technology question, are there maybe some innovations out there that are, you know, tackling that issue of food packaging? Um, I think with food waste packaging, you know, a lot, some of it, you know, you have a whole different variety, right? You have some that have to go to landfill, you have some that can be recycled, and you do have some that can be composted, you know, the real, one of the greatest environmental impacts of this is, you know, like, some of this gets sent to landfill, you know, landfills are these giant you know, places where just trash gets thrown, you know, leachate can grow there, which is sort of like that toxic cocktail of different chemicals from things just degrading. Some of these packaging just does not degrade at all over time. They just remain in the environment and, you know, harm wildlife and our own health. And, um, you know, when you see compostables as well, those are great. However, um, we don't necessarily in all locations, AU is lucky that we do have Prince George's composting where we can send these compostable plastics, but not all locations have access to a facility like that where those compostable plastics can be um, disposed of properly. And so they end up going to landfill anyway. A really important point of those compostable plastics is that what compostable means is that it can compost under the right conditions. And you need a facility like Prince George's County that really controls you know, the climate, the heat and like the sunlight so that it does degrade in those right conditions so that it be, actually becomes compost. And so that also brings in something very important, maybe later down the line, not during COVID, of really reducing the use of these single-use packaging products and really switching over more towards reusable items. So like, you know, reusable to go to containers or, you know, reusable meal like uh, utensil sets or reusable coffee cups. Yeah, I think we need to start moving away basically from single use plastics. And I know um, at a grocery store, it's going to be harder than at a restaurant, but we, when it comes to like innovations, I think um, we work with a restaurant in Boston where all of their to go is reusable. So it's like a glass container where if you have leftovers or you're ordering out, they package it up for you. And then, you know, there's an incentive for you to then bring that container back. So they clean it, you get a new one the next time you're there. Um, but just the single use plastics, are, I think, are what really kill us. Um, and so moving towards more re reusable options, I know for us, something we're thinking about is we, we really um, ask the people who use our app, like when you're going to go pick up a too good to go surprise bag, bring your own bag um, and make sure it's your reusable one, because we don't want our partners to have to package everything up in plastic um, and paper bags and have that be, you know, 
another thing that is impacting the environment when we're supposed to be chipping away at it in the first place. So I think really thinking about, especially, you know, as students, like my reusable water bottle, my reusable tote, like how can I reduce my waste so that I'm not, you know, going to Starbucks every day, getting a, a plastic coffee cup and then throwing it out. Yeah, thank you for those responses. Uh, definitely, I, I can totally agree. I, I, our, I, even myself, I've had to try to push myself away from uh, single-use uh, plastic, or I just only just recently started bringing uh, reusable bags. And it, I mean, it wasn't something I even thought about before, but it does make such a huge difference. Um, so I think we have time for one or two more questions. Um, Corin wants to ask, what are the biggest challenges that you foresee the world facing in the fight to reduce wasted food? And how can we best respond to those challenges? Um, I think part of that is probably like, I think I'm going back to sort of like the infrastructure to make collection more accessible. I think you sort of see that, you know, becoming more and more common now, but even still like these composting facilities or these anaerobic digesters are not cheap. They're very expensive to, you know, set up these things at end of cycle. And, you know, with source reduction, that's more of a, you know, it's just sort of a culture thing, you know, really creating a culture that values these, you know, sustainable principles such as meal planning or, you know, meal prep or how to prepare foods and using all parts of the plant or the animal. These are all things that, you know, take a very long time to be adopted into a culture. So, you know, sort of on one end, you know, you have like a very high cost with certain things and also staffing these collection programs. On the other hand, you have sort of like a, a cultural norms type of thing that will take a long, that could take a long time to really be adopted. Yeah, and I think it, it really just comes down to awareness of the issue. Um, and especially with consumers and individuals and households, that's where the biggest amount of food waste comes from. Um, and so if we can get people to start thinking about the food that they're eating, the food that they're buying, and really make sure that the waste is reduced in the household, I think that will be huge. And then having those households then, you know, hold policy holders to that standard. Um, make, make sure you are driving policies forward that combat food waste. I think something to think about is, you know, um, over a trillion dollars goes to waste per year. Just of people going to the grocery store, going to a restaurant, buying food and then tossing it out. Um, and I'm sure there's many families, I'm sure like everyone on this call would love to have the money back on the food that they ended up throwing away. But instead of, you know, kind of shelling out cash here for your, your $100 of groceries and only eating 40 of it, really being intentional with the food that you're consuming, the food that you're buying, where you're getting it from, um, and having conversations with people to raise that awareness. Because to be honest, before I worked at Too Good To Go and I was with all of these like-minded people who all we do every day is talk about, you know, um, how to combat food waste, like what foods are good for the environment, why you shouldn't eat, you know, um, almonds. Um, it wasn't something that was 100% on my radar. So I think the more conversations you can have with people about why and how it impacts us on a day-to-day -day basis, um, that's really where the change comes from. All really good points. The questions, by the way, in the question box are so good. Um, so I'll just kind of also say that even though a lot of w wasted food and, and uh, wasted food happens at the household level, there's also a broader agricultural context instead of crises and what is churning commodity crop overproduction of corn and of soybeans um, and of frankly non-nutritious, very toxic food in terms of the agrotoxins involved in the uh, you know, incredible carbon footprint of our current food system. And there's been a kind of a, a, a history of blaming farmers um, which is not productive analytically or politically or socially. Farmers are part of this kind of treadmill of overproduction. And um, there's a corporate corporate kind of stranglehold on the entire agri-food industry. And a few companies kind of control and are price makers and drive the price down for farmers. They're in this kind of constant treadmill of overproducing to make ends meet. Um, and meanwhile, the, the selling of, of food at particularly produce and horticulture, especially crops is very high. So I think there's a broader political economy crisis that we need to also as individuals and as movements address 
um, and ag policy problems. So this project disparity to parity.org is trying to recover the history of supply management, which is a, long, a century long history in US ag policy, but got eroded in neoliberalism, you know, with kind of get government out um, mind, mind frame. And so what that's done is it's bottomed out farm prices, put farmers on this kind of collision course of overproduction um, and led to um, non-nutritious food being kind of saturated in the food system um, and lead to broader food injustices and lack of food security and food sovereignty. So I would say that is an important piece of this. Um, but also just there was a question of Natasha's about COVID. Very important point. At the household level, I do think there really was a lot more consciousness about food and where it comes from and the value of it and the skill sets and revaluing the kind of intellectual skills of cooking everything and saving food and understanding um, the food system. But at the agricultural level, there was more food waste. It's actually food loss. Before it reaches the kind of market, it's called food loss. And you had a lot of farmers actually plow food under and a lot of um, animals that were gonna be used as meat get killed um, without even the meat being used. Um, and so that has to do with the supply chains and how um, how homogenous and non-regional the supply chains are and non-adaptive. So if you have like one meat processing factory um, that got closed because there was a COVID outbreak there because all the workers were shoulder to shoulder, then the entire meat flows of food got stopped and they had to be destroyed. So I think the, the, the response is a need for a more regionalized, localized, multi-scalar, direct supply chains, adaptive, resilient food system, as opposed to these kind of like mono, huge, four processing plants in the, in the entire country that are all corporate owned uh, models. So it's a great question. And I feel like COVID actually, the precarities of our food system were laid bare. Thank you for that, yeah. Um, thank you for, all, to all the panelists and to everyone who's asked questions during this uh, panel, this has been such a great discussion. I know for myself, I've learned so much just in this hour. Um, um, to all the audience members, um, just a reminder that if you attended this panel tonight, you are you could potentially win a Too Good To Go gift bag. Um, please check your emails tomorrow morning to see if you won. So on behalf of the PR, our portfolio class, the School of Communication and AU's Office of Sustainability, we would like to thank Professor Grady Lovelace, Ali Sale, and Jesse Cross for joining us tonight and leading an incredible conversation about fighting food waste. And thank you to each of you who joined us this evening, and please enjoy a free Too Good To Go meal on us. Go to the Apple Store or Google Play to download the Too Good To app today, and use the voucher code AmericanU to get a surprise bag for free. Lastly, we would like to thank our professor, Gemma Puglisi, for all her hard work this semester, helping our class grow and learn and be able to put this event on. Um, thank you all so much um, for being here tonight, and we hope you feel inspired to go forth and fight food waste in your everyday life. Thank you, and happy holidays. Uh,